pick it? Yes, you can. You know, good morning. You know, good morning. When I was young, uh, growing up, for a long time, I thought I didn't like music. Closed unused applications. Boy, Facebook, you are you are really needy. You know that? It wants me to close unused applications. It wants me to shut stuff down. Fine, I will. I'll shut all this stuff down. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. Uh, let's close everything down while we're getting set up for the live show. Force quit that. Music's doing some silliness. Close that. I'm definitely going to close messages. You know, I should probably do this before. You guys think? Hello, two viewers. Tell me who you are. Put your name in the comments. Let's get a right little chatting going on. Uh, when I was young, I uh, really thought I didn't like music at first because I hated a lot of what was on the radio and because I was contrarian. So whatever was cool, I part of how I learned to like make my way in the world was that's not cool. I'm going to go this direction, which is fine. It's just an, it's it's every bit as reactive as going with the grain. You can see that if you, um, you know, people that are like, uh, I don't know, anti whatever is hip, they, they're they just as much in the throw, in the sway of what is popular, what is hip, what is going on as everyone else. It's just they're going the opposite direction. Good morning, Andrew. Anyhow, um, the thing about that was I assumed music sucked and like music and then and I especially was like, rap's bad. I hate rap. And then as I've grown, I've discovered how much I love hip hop. It took me about 10 years to get over myself and to start to explore hip hop and really to discover like all of this great jazz music that my dad loved reused it as hip hop. And, uh, and so like Tribe Called Quest is one of the greats, probably the goats greatest of all time, in my opinion. And uh, so that's how I was starting this off. That was a long story for no point. There's six people here. Tell me who you are. Put your names in the comments, people. It's more fun, I promise. You pop the name in there, you're going to have a good time. That's guaranteed. Good time guaranteed. Uh, well, it's December the 3rd. That means I'm in the throes. Hello, Karen or Fernanda. Tom Brady goat. All the goats, Andrew. The goat goats. The greatest of all time. I'm glad that we came up with that acronym. Andrew, are you getting a lot of start and stop on the on the signal? Hey, Lindsay, there's a name I haven't seen for a while. Good evening. I hope you've got a hot beverage, maybe with a little bit of liqueur in it. It's really interesting how the stream is uh, stuttery. I have no idea what's going on. I've got fiber. So that's that's sharp. I'll have to get that uh, sorted out because I don't know what's going on that's doing that. Does anyone else see that where it like pauses and it's like, hey, uh, live stream is jittery, can't connect, and then it starts again. Anyone else getting that? I'm getting that. Um, so yeah, it's December. That means it's my month off, um, which I've had quite a... Ah, oh, that's so annoying, isn't it, Andrew? I wonder what's causing that. It says closed unused applications. I don't want to do that. Hey, Abril, nice to see you. Uh, well, let's just close Safari too. I've closed everything now. There should be nothing. I got nothing. I'm running naked. Yeah, I have to kick Bay out of her office, take over the spot. Uh, let's open a new window here so I can just see you guys. Oh, you're there. Perfect. That works great. Not. Oh, Lindsay's not getting it. Cool. And it seems like it might be a little bit clearer for now. So we'll see. We'll work with it. This is leadership, is being with whatever's showing up in the morning and not collapsing into it, no matter how annoying you find it. December used to be when I took them off. Um, it was it was like everything fell off kind of a cliff because I was the one generating everything. Uh, so like I was hustling, and we need to do that in the early days. Whenever you start a business, and especially when people get into coaching, uh, initially the hope is like, well, if I just become good enough, if I just learn how to coach well enough, sort of like if I just become a good enough plumber that'll suffice. That's all I need to do. And if something isn't happening for me, like if I'm not making clients and stuff like that, then there's something wrong with this perfect. People just don't want it, you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but that's not the case at all. I don't believe for a few reasons, some of which I may go into. 
the main point though is initially we got to hustle we got to get out there we got to talk to people and so in the early days for me the way that looked like would be i'd go out to networking events i'd chat to people i'd tell them what i did i'd ask for their business card i'd ne- i'd almost never give them one I'd, I'd give them one of mine if they wanted one but like i needed their business card because i was going to be the one following up giving them mine eh, that's not really very valuable I'd get their business card, I'd come home and I immediately send them off an email. Hey, nice to meet you. I loved what you're up to. If you're interested in a coaching conversation, let me know. I'd love to to do that. What do you say? What do you say? Yes or no? Opportunity for them to say I'd like that or no, thank you. And um, so the I was driving my results forward. I was at cause to create results. And as the decades happened, the decade I've been doing this work, and I've taken on more of my own work, worked with my own coach, deepened into the training I've taken, so on and so forth. Um, the biggest thing that's changed is my being, how I show up in the world, the being that I bring into the space, the way I'm able to be with whatever's showing up, including Facebook being fiddly and dumb. And so from that being shifting, what I notice happens is the more we work on who we're being in the world, the more magnetic we become. And the way my coach put it when she was acknowledging me one day was we go from hustling and working to create results to becoming a clearing in which results show up. So what that means is on some level, you become so open and available, not like you don't have any boundaries at all and people can take advantage of you, but more there's no um, there's no need for you to hold the world at bay. You're not contracting from the world and shutting stuff out. And what that allows is for the abundance of the universe to flow through you and to you. And from there, you don't have to hustle as much, it turns out, because there's just an abundance. There's really, truly an abundance. And so it kind of works on a spiritual level. I apologize that I can't break this down into a more scientific bent for us right now. But on, on, on that level, there's just the results tend to show up without having to do a lot of hustling. So the reason I'm sharing this is, yo, yo, hey, Sheila, long time. Nice to see you. The reason I'm sharing this is because one of the things that's interesting as my month shifts over into December and I don't have any calls scheduled is that I don't have as many client calls, but there's an abundance of calls still showing up. There's an abundance of people showing up in my life being like, hey, can we hop on the phone? And I take a look to see what's going to support me. I don't have anything scheduled like I do typically out of these months, but it's kind of interesting to watch myself in it and be like, oh yeah, here I am. I've got a call after this live show. And then on Monday, I've got a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that's kind of interesting as, uh, as I share about this is that I've been listening to a podcast called Ear Hustle. I'm just going to try to find it for you. Ear Hustle podcast. So I can post a link because you know I like doing that for you guys. Ear Hustle. Here we go. Ear Hustle SQ. So Ear Hustle. Man, do I love this podcast. It's my favorite podcast right now, bar none. It's produced entirely in San Quentin prison. San Quentin, it turns out, is one of the better prisons that you can get to as an inmate. And what they mean by better is there's a lot of self-help programs. There's a lot of um, w- positive ways to support inmates to like better themselves, to, to move through the stuff. It's a level two prison in the States, as opposed to a level four is the maximum security, I believe, quite a bit more dangerous. Level two is um, older guys. It's a male only prison, of course, older prisoners, inmates, and um, And there's a a little more freedom. I mean, you're still stuck in a tiny cell and and doing all that. So Ear Hustle is fascinating for a whole bunch of reasons. One, because you get to hear prisoners talk about their daily life, which I've always been like, what is prison like? I've watched Oz. I love that show, but surely that's not what it's like. People getting murdered every second day and getting raped every other day. Is it that bad? That's crazy. So San Quentin, at least, is not. And... um, Another thing I notice is you hear these people talk and and almost every one of them are incarcerated for committing murder that you hear talked. So these are people that have committed heinous acts, crimes for which they should be. uh, They should pay a cost. There should be some reconciliation that they must pay. 
uh, I don't know whether locking people away is the right move or not, but that's not really where I'm intending to go in with this. What I find fascinating, and let me take a step back, what I believe is that the heart of transformation is empathy. In order for us to create any kind of transformation and ultimately any kind of healing, because healing and transformation are kind of similar, transformation is inherently healing. To create any kind of healing, any kind of transformation, any kind of, um, uh, what's the word? It's not vindication, it's um, rehabilitation maybe, or healing or whatever, moving someone through this, we require empathy. If I just throw you in a box and turn my back on you, there's very little empathy and you're left even further isolated and unable to get back into the village, so to speak, to be with other humans to understand. So you, in listening to this podcast, I find I develop a great deal of empathy for these people who committed horrible crimes and have done a lot of work to go through that, to sit in reconciliation um, sittings, uh, to sit in uh, restorative justice, where they sit with the victim's family and listen and, and like be with all of that. This does not make what they've done right in any regard, right? That crime can never be undone. And they're very clear in their own conscious of that fact. So it's quite um, it's quite uh, transformative for me to listen to this, to hear these prisoners share their story, share their remorse. And it's really fascinating to um, just hear about what they're up to. And some of the things that I've heard that are really cool, um, I promise it's gonna come around to how I got on here, uh, which was kind of like time, December, all of that. But, um, Andrew, I'd love to hear about that. I didn't know you worked in a prison. I'd be fascinated to hear more about that. Uh, I'd love to know which one and anything you want to share. Uh, one of the things that's cool is they want, did an episode on unwritten politics in the prison. And one of those unwritten rules that have been there forever. So these are not rules in, imposed by the prison itself. It's created. It's a grassroots kind of unwritten rule that got created by the inmates. And that rule is you do not cross racial lines. You can talk to other people of other races. You don't ignore each other, but like you stick with your own and you can bring food to, you know, someone from another race. There's kind of like blacks, Hispanics, whites, Pacific Islanders slash Asians. They all get kind of grouped together. So you can bring food that's in a package and hand it over to the other prisoner. But you can't bring food that's opened, that's been cooked with or anything like that. I presumably because back in the day when San Quentin was more dangerous, people would get killed by that. Hey, Rath. So anyhow, they got these rules like that, but they were saying in this podcast that one of the places where the rules don't exist, where the lines for race are blurred is with the nerds in prison. And they were, had this whole story about these people playing Magic the Gathering in prison, Dungeons and Dragons, and how that's one place where racial lines are blurred. You can, the, the white guys hang out with the black guys, hang out with the Asians, cast fireballs, sling cards back and forth with each other. So it does my heart good to know that there is humanity even in the darkest of places. And I hope it does your heart good too. And if that sounds interesting to you, Ear Hustle is a fascinating podcast. Last thing I wanna say about this before we start to get to our topics is that um, they, uh, they were talking about like, what's a day like? And Erlon, uh, one of the hosts of the podcast was sharing like, we're busy. Uh, you know, you got stuff to do. You're, you're running your day. You're going to one program. You're going to your next program. You're trying to do stuff. You're planning stuff out. You're trying to write a letter to someone. You're getting on the phone with someone. We're doing a podcast. And I just thought, isn't that delightful that even we, we lock people away, we turn our backs on them because they've done horrible things, but humanity is always there. The human spirit is always there and scarcity of time has, you got nothing but time. You're in a cage. You have no freedom still time management scarcity of time so i i took delight in that highly recommend that podcast it's really good and if nothing else i think it'll bring some empathy uh to people that could really use it i believe a lot of these crimes are um it's a stand i have so it's not to take responsibility off of the individual wouldn't do that but that we also need to bear a collective responsibility. A lot of these things that happen are the function of the fact that societally we, we don't have 
ways of holding and caring for and loving people as we would in a village, in a smaller group, where like in a smaller group, the person that's starting to, to, to stray off the path, the village puts their arms around them, the village talks to them, they're noticed, they're seen. The way society has gotten, the size of it and all of that, I'm not condemning society, I'm just saying the way we are at, there's way more places where those people don't get held, they fall through the cracks. And then as people fall through the cracks, and are left feeling more and more isolated, more and more alone, more and more hateful of themselves, it's hard for them to have em any empathy for anyone else. And that's where it becomes easier for us to cause harm to other people. If I don't feel empathy towards you, it's much easier for me to dehumanize you and hurt you or cause harm or commit crimes or all of that stuff. So I think it creates empathy and I think that's a healthy thing. And I think that's one of the things that we could always use more of in our society. Uh, okay, Andrew, fascinating. As an officer, so a correctional officer, like a CO, is that what you were? A screw, I think they call you? That's crazy. Eight years. Holy mackerel. Boy, you and I have to get on the phone and talk about that at some point because that, I can't, that must have been a really challenging job. Let's talk about some of these distinctions we've got now that we're here. Um, I was looking, I'm going to speak to Andrew, you brought a question. David, you brought a question. Thank you, both of you. It's always so much more fun when we have that. And I was looking through. Uh, what are some things I want to be inspired by to like, wh where's some inspiration, some stuff I could talk about. And I picked up this book, Straight Line Leadership. I cannot recommend this book enough. I know camera, camera gets all blurry when I put stuff close to it. It's like, don't do that. I'm trying to look at your face, Adam. Look at all those book darts in there. What's amazing about this book is that the whole, every chapter is a distinction. Uh, or almost wanting versus creating stop stopping versus stopping uh, a problem versus a decision to make what I know versus what I live what to want to versus choose to can't versus won't so distinction 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 boom they're all up in this and they're really well written short punchy tight really really great book so straight line leadership by Dushan Jukik and I'm going to find you just because I'm this great guy i'm going to find you where you can get it straight line coach so it's still his website yep bring it up united states you gotta bear with me while i do i do this for you guys free resources here we go and then you can download this book for free you just got to sign up for his emailing list you won't get this hardcover i bought this because i like the book so much but the pdf is free and boy did i read that a lot so I was skimming through this and I was like, ooh, there's some good um, distinctions in there that I'd like to talk about. So we're going to go over a few of those today. This is the distinction episode. Great book. Really, um, Dushan is, mm, I find him a bit, uh, he's not always the best. I've had a few conversations with him and I find he's not always the best at meeting people where they're at, which is in coaching and transformational work, we need equal parts love and rigor. And sometimes we got to vary those measures. He is magnificent at rigor and in cutting through the bullshit. So if you're if you're not someone in need of a lot of love, and that can be challenging to self-diagnose, usually the people are like, I don't need a lot of love, are the best served by a lot of love. But um, his writing is very like cut to the quick, get to the point, boom, here's where you're stopped. Stop stopping there. Move past that. Let's go kind of ran me over when I had a few calls with him. At the time I was um, I was considering hiring him, which was gonna be a 50K investment, which at the time was pretty frightening. I'd already borrowed, we'd borrowed a, probably about $100,000 of money from the equity in our home, which was all that we had. Plus we had $100,000 of student loans at the time. So I borrowed that to like train as a coach, to hire my coach, to to do more training, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm considering like ugh, hiring this other guy. And I shared that, that fear with him. And he was kind of like, uh, you know, Adam, it's like, you're, it's like you're standing on a sidewalk thinking about stepping off the curve. Like it's nothing. What do you, what do you even in this conversation with me about? It's like, I'm scared, dude. <laughs> like, give me, meet me there a little bit, but that's just not his strong suit. Oh, hi, Carol. Well, thanks for popping in to say a bonjour. Hashtag catch on the replay. 
Okay, well, let's, uh, we'll, so we'll get to those distinctions and they're gonna be great and they'll completely change your life, as you know. That's the guarantee we make here. Um, so let's see, I like what Andrew wrote here. I'm gonna read this all out, but this is, we're gonna talk about leading versus coaching or um, like kind of um, giving someone something versus supporting them to arrive at it themselves. Uh, all of those sort of things. Hey, Adam, nice to see you, man. Go team Adam. One of my closest friends is also named Adam, and he named his son Adam Jr. So there's a real, like, if you live in Victoria and you can feel the the power generating, that's, that's you know, just a coalescence of Adams. There's a very potent energy here in Victoria. And if you're named Adam, you're, hey, move on over to Victoria. You're welcome here. Get your ass over here. Andrew, you're allowed to come too because you you kind of like your name's similar enough. We'll bring you in. You could you couldn't come into the the Adam space, the virtual space that we all coalesce and meet in. But like you can be in Victoria, you can be a part of our crew. Okay, I'm being silly. Let's cut this crap as do Sean would do. So Andrew writes, a question came up for me in a training this week, and I'd really like to hear your thoughts on it. When it comes to coaching conversations, I'm going to say also leadership conversations. When do I potentially lead the conversation as a coach or as a leader versus um, giving them something, pointing to something? My default is to put it back on the client and have them explore. However, there are definitely points in conversation where the person in front of me wants to know how I do it, what's my strategy, et cetera. I see the opportunity in being willing to answer those questions at times, but I also have judgment about doing so because I see that the client answering their own questions or carving their own path is the highest place to be. So let's um lay kind of the how do we get here from like why is this even a conversation where is andrew finding himself and then what do we do with that so the default where all of us begin because this is the way society is set up is not at all what andrew's talking about we might like to believe that we're doing that but what we do by default is we tell people what to do we give them advice from a well-meaning in, intentionally helpful place but it's advice which is telling them what we think they should do. We ask leading questions, which are like asking them the question that we know will help them arrive at the conclusion that we know that they need to make so that they will do the thing that we are aware they must do. Or we will teach them, which is another way of showing them what to do and so on and so forth. I don't wanna condemn any of that stuff. It's all done with a beautiful heart, very well intended. And there's, there's times when that's precisely what's required. There's times when someone coaching you, when what you're looking for is to be taught something is obnoxious. If I went to a piano lesson and I was like, um, all right, I'm going to learn jazz. I want to learn to improvise as a jazz player. How do I do that? And he's like, well, how do you think you do that? Be like, fuck you, guy. I'm here for you to tell me how to do that. How do I like what's a scale I should learn? I don't know. What scale do you think? you've? I'm out of here. Right? It'd be very obnoxious, not helpful. So it's not to say that any of that's wrong. It just has a, it's distinct. And it's our default. Oftentimes, people that aren't uh, aren't trained in coaching call them and choose into coaching. What you get is people doing this at you. So they'll someone I was talking to someone the other day, and they were sharing about an experience they'd had with a coach where they were just talking about something, they were working through something, the person said, oh, well, that's because you just, I can't remember exactly what the words were, which is just as well. They said something like the coach told them, oh, well, that's just because of your relationship with your parents and you don't love yourself. Something along those lines. That's not for someone to put on to you. That's for you to distinguish yourself. So that's often what we get when we end up working with someone who created a successful business, but has no training as, as a coach. So we begin there. That's where we all start as humans, is, is tell people what to do, help them get to where we know they ought to be, blah, 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 blah. And fundamentally underneath that, unconsciously, is the belief that I know better than you. I don't fully trust you to find your own path. And probably in, in addition to that, um, I'm not willing to feel the pain of you bumbling around as you discover your own path. None of that's conscious, none of that's distinguished, but that's kind of what lies underneath this. It's heartbreaking for me to watch you fumble around in the dark and feel pain, like suffer. So I'm gonna save you from that heartbreak. Let me show you how to do it. Let me do it for you. 
So that's where we begin. And then as someone gets trained as a coach and or a leader, what happens is all of that stuff we start with gets set aside. We're trained, don't do that, now stop doing that. And it's really annoying because we're like, no, 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 but trust me, there's more on in front of me, really needs the gifts, the wisdom I have to offer to them. Uh, no, you gotta set that aside. So we train ourselves to set it aside. And early on, what we, get trained to do is to set it aside completely. And the reason we set it aside completely is because it's all we've done for the last 20, 30 years of our life. It's everything. And so it's sort of like, um, let's say that you were drinking a lot and you were like, I really wanna change my relationship to drinking. I am going to only drink every second day or something like that. That's problematic because you kind of got to set the thing aside totally so you can start, you can create a new slate. It's not the best example because it gets into addiction and stuff like that. Um, but what we want to do is like, yeah, but I'm good at this. I don't want to let this go. What do I do about it? And you have to set it aside. We struggle with that because then we're left without our well-worn and well-known tool. We're like, ah, but I don't know how to, ah. And it forces you to have to be with all the stuff that you didn't have to be with because of what you were doing before. So as we practice with this, we initially set aside all of the old ways of telling people what to do, all of the stuff that we knew how to do, all of the wisdom we have that this person in front of us really needs. We practice instead letting them discover their own way. And it's awkward and it's clumsy and it feels inefficient because in some ways, if, if my job is just to make you do the thing that I know how to do, then the most efficient way to do that is to control your hands. The second most efficient way is to give you a list of steps, follow these steps, do them exactly. But if my goal is to support you in learning how to achieve a particular thing your way rather than my way and to discover that, then the most efficient path is to let you bumble because that's the only way any of us learn. This, by the way, is why children learn so much faster than adults. They don't have all of this here's how you're supposed to learn. They're just like, I'll try this. Nah, it didn't work. I'll try this. Nah, it didn't work. I tried this. Okay, that kind of worked, but I need to tweak it. Okay, I'll try that way. Ah. They move very organically. So we start telling the world what to do, knowing better than everyone, not trusting people, blah, 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 blah. And then we shift to wiping that all off the table. Now, the hot, and what that does is it allows us to practice with something new, because as soon as you leave that old tool on the table, you're just naturally going to reach for it. You're not even going to notice you've reached for it. So the best thing to do is wipe it off completely. Force yourself to go cold turkey for a while. Once we've done that, we can get to really where Andrew's question is at, which is, great, I've stopped doing the one thing. Now I'm here, but it feels at times kind of uncomfortable or like it might be a little bit like, is this really the thing for me to do? And the answer is no. Because at the highest levels of practice and whatever you're up to, what we're aiming towards is the capacity to bring, do, be, whatever will best serve and support that person. The trouble is that when we are starting out, we got no fucking clue whatever will best support that person because we're all up over here and our own arrogance, our own knowing best for them, our own all of that stuff. So we have to walk through that period where we drop it completely before we can then start to bring that stuff in a little bit different. And so, Sheila, that's awesome. Congrats on going for your PCC. That's very exciting news. I just went, I, I got my MCC a few months back and it's any, any process of going through getting feedback evaluation is very humbling, I find. So uh, my hat's off to you. So as we start to bring this new stuff in, the real question that we're looking at is how, where does this person need me to meet them? What's best going to serve this person? So sometimes I'll have clients come to me and they've spent their whole life either being the expert and telling people what to do or the reciprocal of that, finding experts and having them tell them what to do. So if you, this, by the way, you always get both halves of the equation. So if you're someone who really likes to teach a lot, you're naturally gonna go into the world and try to find teachers to teach you. If your edge in leadership is to stop telling people what to do, your edge will also include uh, putting an end to finding someone else to tell you what to do. 
which is why you will come to me and find it very frustrating at first because I'm going to coach you rather than tell you what to do. So if I have clients come to me, sometimes I get clients that come to me that have spent their whole life finding masters and working with those masters or being leaders that have worked with masters, the masters told them to do, and then they dispense their own mastership to their, you know, their, the people below them, their followers, their direct reports. And so for those people, if I just kind of um, refuse to give them anything, refuse to offer them anything, refused to provide them one iota of here's what I think would work best. And instead I just stood there and was like, well, what do you think all the time? They're gonna get more and more frustrated because they're, it's a bumping into their edge. Their edge being trusting themselves and not, and trusting other people when they're leading them, but trusting themselves and being willing to practice fucking it up rather than having the master tell them exactly how to do it so they can do it without any risk of fucking up. And so it's important for me as a coach to recognize this, just me not giving them the answer is a gradient for them. There's a threshold that they currently have to practice trusting themselves. So how much can they be with right now? What's the level of trusting themselves right now? And so early on with, uh, there's one client in particular, um, in the early days, I would offer him a lot. He would show up and ask me for a lot of like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And I'd, I'd kind of, couple things. First, I'd flag like, okay, it's dangerous because I love teaching and I'm good at it. So just notice, Adam, there's a bit of a potential sticky spot here for your own ego. Noting that. Two, noting this client has a desire for me to teach them, tell them a lot of stuff. I'm going to note that. And early on, what I would do is just flag it. So say, hey, I noticed that you kind of seem to have this desire to, to be taught more than to learn to trust yourself. I get it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to push you beyond that, but it also occurs to me like that might be a little bit in the way of you creating the things you said you want to create, trusting yourself, really knowing your own path. Does that make, how does that sit with you? Oh yeah, I can kind of, that kind of makes sense. Okay, great. So I'm willing to give you an answer, but do you want to practice the other thing or would you like me to provide you an answer? Oh, I'd really like an answer right now. Great. Here's the answer. So one of the best ways that we can support people is by not figuring this stuff out ourselves. Notice that in that, whether I'm coaching someone or leading them, what I'm doing is I'm distinguishing, I'm staying off the court, I'm, I'm identifying the way this person's patterns show up, I'm pointing to it so that they can see it, and then I'm letting them choose. If my client was like, Adam, I want you to tell me what to do for the next year, I would be like, okay, I'm happy to do that if that's what you want to pay me money for. And then I would Ask them, like, can we look at that first? How has that gone in your life? Are there other places where that's the way you show up? What does that get you? What's what's inevitable as that happens? Great. Should we be on the lookout for that? Yeah, yeah totally. Now tell me what to do. Great. Do this, this, and this. Okay, cool. And they come back next week. How did that go? Well, I did it, but it didn't work. And now I'm mad at you. Okay, great. Does that happen often when you ask people? So it's not necessarily that we have to force the client to go in a direction or like withhold something from the client or any of that. It's that we're always giving the client, we're meeting them where they're at, and then we're allowing them the ability to notice how it goes for them, which is a beautiful thing because that's how we learn. That's the heart of learning. Do a thing, see how it goes, make the next decision. When people want to figure out, this is a digression. When people want to figure out what they want, I don't know what I want. I wish I could figure out what I want. What do I need to do? Ah, Adam, help me figure out what I want. What they want is me to take them through like some exercise where there's like 50 words they choose from and then we triangulate them and then it says like, you want cupcakes, goats, and to cut meat for a living. There you go. But that won't set them free. The way that we discover what we want is we choose a thing and then we sit with it for a while longer than our probably current threshold allows for. So we sit with it. Here's the thing I chose. How do I feel about this? Kind of good. And then a couple more days, kind of sucks. Don't like it as much. Sit with it a few more days. I'm not going to choose this again. Sit with it a few more days. I'm ready to choose something different and try a different thing. So that's how you discover what you want is by a willingness to practice choosing. It's the choice that sets people free. Their fixation on figuring out what they want is what stops them from choosing. 
and it's choosing that would actually help them figure out what they want. Crazy, right? Us humans, we're bonkers. Uh, Andrew, yeah, Andrew just saying, thanks for distinguishing it this way. It gives me a lot more to work with. I really like the partnership aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 we're meeting the client where they're at and finding their gradient and supporting them to keep leaning into it. And from there, it becomes a lot less work, right? If, if I don't have to figure any of this stuff out, I can just keep giving it over to the client. So the irony of coaching is that when people aren't doing their own work, when they're not working with their own coach, it's the fucking hardest job in the world. They're getting empathetically blown out. They're exhausted. They're doing all this work, trying to figure stuff out for the client. They're wearing the client's frustration. As you do more work to allow yourself to trust people in their own path and really honor the way they're showing up, there's less for you to do. And then you don't have to do anything. You just show up and be with them. Just like I'm showing up and being with y'all right now. Just like when I play video games, I show up and be with the video game and destroy my opponent. Just like, just like, just like. Uh, some congratulations for order. So Sheila, again, congrats on, on going for that PCC. Andrew, congrats on getting that ACC and the PCC. The cool thing, Andrew, is that, uh, since you're going through AC, they grade at the PCC level. So if you pass, well, the good news is you're already training. To, to hit that mark. So that's awesome. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about what David's brought here. Thank you, Andrew, for that great question. David says, Adam, can you speak about the partnership of spirit and being open to what life has to offer beyond our desires to be intentional? So David's asking about the paradox of being committed and declaring a particular result and opening ourselves up to spirit and what it, life puts in front of us. How do we manage those two? So the way we typically manage those two is we put them in opposition to one another. When you put stuff into opposition, they become an either or in your life. Either I'm super fucking committed and I set goals and I blow myself out to achieve them, or I read The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer, great book, but when people put it in this continuum, they get into trouble. I read The Surrender Experiment. He sounds so cool. That life sounds so nice. I'm not going to make any declarations. I'm just going to let life bring to me what it brings to me, and I'm going to be surrendered to it, and I'll accept everything that shows up. Neither of these is a particularly powerful way to show up in our life or put, put a little more... Um, Accurately, both of these ways of showing up in life will get you thus far, but then it'll stop you from getting further. There's a degree of creating, impacting, living your life and experiencing your life that can not ever come to you from these two, this dichotomy when it's set up like this. So what a lot of people do is they, they pendulum. And you see this a lot, um, I experienced this kind of in the heart of Robin Sharma's book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, where this, that, that's a, a parable, a story about this guy who was like, I think his name was Julian, and he was crazy fixated on work, and he was a high-powered lawyer, and he like collapsed in court. He was really wealthy, had beautiful suits. So he's on the committed end, right? He's committed. He does everything. He burns himself out to make his commitments. And then... He falls down, he collapses, and he goes to a convent, and he like meditates, and then he comes back, and he's all on this side. He surrenders to whatever life is. He opens up. He allows life, blah, blah, blah. So people, like, they go from being an, uh, the way Christopher McAuliffe, the CEO of Accomplishment Coaching, put this to me, is you go from an, uh, being an exclamation mark in your life to being a question mark. Everything's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I love that distinction. Exclamation mark to a question mark. So this is typically how we think we're, this is how people try to create a breakthrough is by going from one end of the continuum that they've put themselves on to the other end. The bad news is you're still on the continuum. So your life is still a function of whatever's available along this line and not ever can you get the combination of these two. Pro tip, grabbing that pendulum and screeching it and then bolting it into the middle, that doesn't solve this either. So on the one side, I'm committed, I make declarations, I commit to stuff and I make it happen, but I'm kind of burnt out, I feel blown out, it's hard, it feels grindy. 
On the other hand, oh, life is so free and easy and relaxing, but there's not that much intentionality and I can't really go after what I get. I'm just at the effect of whatever the universe gives me. So those are the two extremes. We've got kind of commitment and then on the other side, spirit. The transcendent breakthrough happens when it stops being commitment at the expense of being with whatever's showing up. And the way that that occurs is not in what we do. It occurs in how we're being about the way things happen. So what I mean by that is someone who's created this breakthrough absolutely still makes commitments, declarations in their life, goals. I'm going to I'm going to create 10 clients. I'm going to step into that CFO position by the end of the year and gets clear. What are the actions I have to do? What do I have to make happen? What do I have to actually take on every single day? <clears throat> what do I need to make sure I do this month? What do I need to hold myself accountable to do? And when the results don't happen the way they want, the person is able to be equanimous with it, meaning they don't take that. I mean, they fucking suck. The fact that this happened doesn't mean that I'm a piece of trash or that I'm garbage or that I just don't have what it takes or any of that. It just means that this wasn't the path that was there for me. This was exactly what was meant to happen right now. But it also means that they don't just then resign themselves and shrug their shoulders and walk off into the sunset. They go, oh, well, so let me describe what happens when you hit a goal, a milestone, and you haven't achieved it from this place. You go, okay. That was exactly what was meant to happen. Now, I'm going to take a look through the lens of, I'm going to be about this in partnership with Spirit. Spirit brought me this result so that I could be where I am right now. Now, given I'm committed to something, let's take a look at how this happened. Did I do everything I said I was going to do? No, not at all. Okay, what got in the way? I bring this conversation to your coach or to your leader. What got in the way? Well, I talked a lot about stuff, but I kind of distracted myself with other things. And then if we're still in that continuum, the conversation would very quickly shift to like, but I think that's just the way it was meant to go. And maybe I don't really want this that much. No, don't let yourself off the hook. Come back to your commitment. Hold on. I committed to this. What was in the way? What had me stop wanting it that, that had it go this way? And what would I need to do from here to actually create the result? So it's less... Well, let me put in here, the way I'm offering is edgy for people because it means you stop letting yourself off the hook. It means that when you don't create what you say you're committed to creating, you turn around and you look at like, how did it go? What did I do? And what is there for me to take on responsibility for so that I can have it go differently next time? When we work with people in the forge, one of the things that people create is a project, something that they want to make happen this year. We do this for 50 million reasons, all of them good ones. The biggest one, because that's how your life changes, is by creating a tangible project that you want to move forward. And what tends to happen is people set milestones. By this date, this is the result to create. And then they get to the milestone, they're like, eh. Or they just mu move the milestone forward a, a week or a, a month or whatever. I talked about this last week as well. And they... They don't continue to be their commitment to the project. They shrug it off. And so when we as coach or leader be like, hey, bring that back here. We're not, we're not done. I know it, it, it's not fun that you didn't get there, but we're committed to making you get what you said you wanted. So let's take a look at how it went. So that's how we marry those two. We allow things to unfold the way they unfold without getting bent out of shape or adding additional significance and meaning when we do or don't achieve what we say we're going to achieve. And we take a look and see what is there for me to take on from here? What can I distinguish about how this went? How did I contribute to things going this way? That's what has your life simultaneously transform and create different results, create the impossible while at the same time allowing you to be completely at peace with exactly where you are. What this does is it marries the spirit of our humanity, which is to strive for something beyond where we are, which is a beautiful thing, I tell you. Provided you can also marry that with the spirit of the moment, of, of, of spirit, 
which is that everything currently as it is, is exactly the way it ought to be. And just sit with that. If we can marry those two things, our striving stops being something that chews us up and consumes us from the inside, becomes this beautiful gift that we can live into, into the world. Carol, it does, it takes emotional maturity and a lot of work. And it takes, the thing it takes that most people are unwilling to step into is it takes a willingness to declare results, to make a clear committed declaration of what you're gonna achieve and then come to that not having achieved it and then to feel everything that gets driven up. So to get to the point I'm talking about requires in people a willingness to be with the stuff they hate. But I don't like it, Adam. When I set goals, I don't achieve them and then I feel crappy. I know, we're gonna change that. But in order for us to change it, you got to be willing for that to come up because until it comes up, you can't set it down. We can't do any work. What most people would rather do is avoid anything that drives up that internal experience. And by avoiding it, it's like holding a beach ball into the water. It's not going anywhere. You're not doing any work on it. You're just keeping it under the water. It's like pausing a show on TV. The show's still there. You know, if you're watching a movie that's scary and you just pause it on the scary part and you know you have to watch this movie well it just sits there it eats away at you it doesn't do you any good to pause the scary part in the movie you got to get through it that's how this works this is how we transform so emotional maturity tremendous courage a willingness to step into what we've been avoiding most of our life or what we've arranged our lives to avoid and often support from outside of ourselves, like a leader or a coach who can help us see this stuff and stand for us to continue to face it. Uh, Andrew, just reading your previous comment, really speaks to the power of understanding leadership. In the training, it was pointing that a level above coaching is being able to lead. And it left me with the thought of what for, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. You find this in um, as you go for your master coach certification, you simultaneously are less leading. And then there's also some points where you lead, but then you're always able to bring it back to the, to the client. Whatever we put in, we can always give back to the client for them to do something with. Um, let's talk about, uh, so we've talked about commitment and surrender. We've talked about leading and coaching. Let's talk about, uh, shoulds, ver uh, no, we'll call it commitment versus trying. I think these two are probably pretty similar. Commitment versus trying, should versus must. So when I talked about laying out a project, setting up a goal like that, and what Carol said, which was it takes some emotional maturity to get to that level of acceptance, it's our commitment that gets us there. Our commitment is the thing that has us not just talk about what we know we need to do, but actually do it. Whenever you set a project that is going towards something not currently in your realm of possibility, meaning the way you've learned to be in your life and with life does not currently allow for that thing to happen. The easy way to see this stuff is what's the goals? What are the goals you've given up on? What are the goals you've decided? I'm just going to learn to be okay with the way I am or the way things are, or I just know I can't have that, that stuff. That helps you see the sort of goals that are then gonna drive up your stuff as you go towards them because they don't currently, there's no way that your current way of being allows for them to be possible. So what happens often is when a client comes to me or any other coach that's doing deep breakthrough kind of work is we're gonna ask you, what do you really want in your life? And we're gonna support you to get clear on what you really want in your life. If your life was amazing, off the charts, if you could create it however you want it, what do you really want? And you're going to get clear on that. And then we're going to ask you, so are you willing to commit to this? Most people are willing to try for it. <clears throat> Meaning they'll go through the motions. They'll set up a project. They'll lay it all out. They'll make a nice plan. And then they'll give it their best. They'll like call people. But if someone is like, let's say that we've got a person who's learned to put their well-being their well-being is like the, it's untouchable. It's the thing that can never be encroached upon. This is a, I think we're going to take a bit of a digression here so we can talk about this particular context and how it can stop people. So I've had a few clients like this where the trump card, 
your survival mechanism, your ego, the part of you that keeps you safe right where you are has trump cards. Some examples of trump cards are like, I don't feel safe. Put the brake on everything. Anyone that's standing for you, ah, they don't feel safe. Okay, what do you need? Blah, blah, blah. End of story. You lose all being stood for and the conversation shifts to your safety, which allows you to come back into control. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have the ability to be safe. What I'm saying is that your ego will take safety and use it as a trump card. So literally anything that's a good thing that exists that we must learn to honor can also be taken by your ego and used as a trump card to ensure that it doesn't get pushed beyond its own level of comfort, your level of comfort. Well-being, great trump card. So the way this works is that you're like, okay, I'm gonna make this commitment. I'm gonna take on this big project. It's terrifying. And you start to do stuff and you realize like, wow, I'm gonna have to actually get into some hustle. I'm gonna have to call 10 people every day. Like re remember when I was talking at the start about building my coaching practice, man, I'm gonna have to hustle. I'm gonna have to do some work. I'm gonna have to actually get out there and make calls. And you start to do that and you notice you start to feel tired and drained and exhausted. Oh, I don't feel good. What a great time to take a look at your well-being. And that's the point where your survival mechanism, sounding like yourself and your intuition, your ego, by the way, will adopt the voice of your intuition or authenticity to whisper in your ear and convince you that it's right. So you'll start to be like, man, my well-being feels off. This just doesn't feel good. Trump card. I need to take a break. I'm going to lay off. And then what happens is you don't do what you said you were committed to doing. Instead, you rest and you come to your milestone and you bring it to your coach and they go, hey, how'd it go? And you go, well, I called five people the first day and then I was just so exhausted from that. I took the rest off. I just, you know, I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep it doing. And my well-being is really important. Of course, your well-being is really important. And it's really important to your ego as well. And what you did is you tried to do this thing, but you did not commit to it. So let's draw out a distinction here so you can see what it might look like if you were really committed to this. The first thing that we want to make clear is anytime you're trying to do something outside of what's currently possible for you, whatever your ego and your survival mechanism's trump card is, trying to do that impossible thing is going to clash with the trump card because the trump card is how you stay inside your bubble of comfort and what you know. So the moment you start to try to do something that's edgy and scary for you, trump card. So we can guarantee it's not like the thing you're doing has to be in clashing with your trump card. It's that anytime you get out of your comfort zone, anytime you try to stretch beyond your level of familiarity, your ego is going to throw every trick it's got at you and bring you back to what's comfortable. So trying... I tried, I made those five calls that first day, oh, exhausted, and I had to sleep for the next, I slept in, and so I just didn't do it. That's not a commitment. That's an earnest trying. From commitment, the way this might go, is day one, you make those five calls, and you're exhausted and you're drained. Day two, you wake up and you're like, man, I want to stay in bed, I want to go to sleep, I'm scared of doing that thing, but I made the commitment to do the thing. I'm tired. I can feel I need more rest. What do I need to do to honor my commitment and honor my well-being? Maybe I need to not go out with my friends tonight. Maybe I need to go to bed earlier. Maybe I need to talk to my wife and see if she'll support me so that she can put the kids down. And I can get to bed a little earlier so I can really make good on my commitment. And the next day you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm even more tired. Great. You got to do whatever you got to do to allow for your commitment to happen. And the thing that I can promise is whatever you're taking on that's scary, there is room for your well-being and this scary thing. I guarantee you it's possible. I've done many scary things. My well-being has gone down because that's a safe way for me to get off the hook. And I've, in being committed, it's forced me to figure out how do I ensure that I have my well-being and this new thing. And that's where the breakthrough happens. So when we try, what we do is we never force this clash of titans. 
they never come together because we we let one trump the other and then it's just great all i have to do is honor my well-being and let myself off the hook for my commitment when we say fuck no i'm committed i'm gonna do the thing it forces us to reconcile these two currently disparate and clashing things and only when we're willing to be with that like dissonance only when we're willing to sit with that can they then kind of bump up against each other and eventually come into harmony and then operate together at which point from then onwards once you've created that breakthrough hell yeah now you can make those calls and still have your well-being so that's the difference between commitment and trying and that's why trying gives you the satisfaction of feeling like you're giving it your best while not really holding your feet to the fire and not it's it never where it very, very, very rarely ever causes a breakthrough, like 0.000001%, because it never really forces you to be with that clash, that dissonance, and that reconciliation. Because this very thing, ironically, will feel like it's in conflict with, in conflict with your well-being. So the trump card, so you're even doing this, you're trying to bring them together, and your survival mechanism will be like, trump card on top of the trump card I just played. Fuck you. So don't try. Commit to the thing. Check yourself. Are you actually committed to this? Do you really want that thing that you say you want? Great. Go through all the way and keep doing that work. Hopefully you're seeing how sophisticated our ego is. It's a beautiful thing. Like it, it's your greatest adversary from now until the day you die. And when you make the decision that you want to step into transformational coaching, leadership, and personal development, you are making the commitment to battle, not battle, to like play, to tussle with your ego and its amazing capacity to shift and morph moment by moment from here till the day you die. You have the greatest adversary in the world. And if you can really get that, you can kind of see like, damn, there's nothing I'll ever need to be bored with because this little guy who's moving around, he uses every trick I've got. He speaks to me like he's my voice. I get convinced he's my voice. That's why it's so hard. It's why we simply cannot do this work on our own. It's why we, if we really want to be masterful in our own lives, transformational in our own lives, to have breakthroughs in our own lives, and then to offer other people that gift secondarily, we got to work with a coach. There's no substitute, which is good for my job. <laughs> There's a lot of job security in that. Uh, Andrew, great catch. Andrew's just sharing. I can already see my project design and way of being is based on trying, which can get me a great distance, but I need to reflect on what the actual commitment is. And Andrew says, I see project design, but I really mean all the things that I'm working towards. Try has been a place that I just get better at. Yeah. Trying is not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to hate ourselves for. It's just something to distinguish from commitment. And the reason we distinguish stuff is so that we're clear it's different and will get us different results. I distinguish a apple from a ladder so that when I need to get on my roof, I know which one to grab. I, the, an apple's not bad, an apple's delicious and it's important to have apples. But when I'm trying to get on the roof to clean my gutters, which I don't do because I suck at that, but if I did, I reach for the ladder because it's distinct from an apple and has its own purpose. So commitment is distinct from trying and it has its own really valid purpose. Okay, we got two left. Should versus must. I feel like I should go there next because it's kind of tangential to this. So it's very similar actually. Our shoulds, the stuff we should do, first of all, the danger as soon as I mention that word is that we've turned it into a swear word because people told us, thanks, Andrew, people told us it is a swear word and you should never say it. Notice the should in that. Don't should on yourself. Oh, so I should not should. Okay. Isn't, am I not caught in a time loop now? What, what's going on? Do I somehow get out of this and Kelsey Grammer comes and asks me questions? That's a Star Trek Next Generation reference for all of y'all. The theory of the Mobius. Was that Taken's Rift? I think that was Taken's Rift, maybe? Anyhow, you're not here for the next generation references, unless you are, in which case, send me an email so we can hang out and be friends. Uh, so our should is a swear word. And what that does is it puts us in a position where we don't 
we we hide the fact that we're shooting. We can't just be with the fact that we naturally should on ourselves. Oh, I should do this. Don't do that. I'm not doing that. And then it's harder for us to get access to it because we're kind of pushing it below the surface. So we want to start by giving everyone, but most importantly ourselves, permission to be in a should. It's okay. We all do it. I should do this. So a should is like this thing that we want to do or feel we ought to do, but we're not committed to it. We're not really willing to do what it takes. Instead, it's easier for us currently to just keep feeling the pain of not doing that thing. So you hear people talk about what they should do all the time. Yeah, I should really eat less salt. I should really get up earlier. I should really do X, Y, and Z. I should. Dushan distinguishes what you should do, shoulds, from a must. Just notice, hold those two words together and notice the power just in that distinction. A must doesn't allow wriggle room. If I say I must get up at this point, if I tell you you must stop eating salt or I will shoot you in the head with a gun tomorrow, you will stop eating salt. Now, I apologize for that macabre uh, image. I just finished watching season three of Ozark, so it's all fresh. But there's power in the must. There's weakness. There's no power in a should. A should is this, it's, it's very similar to the try. Yeah, I should do that. I should do that someday. But it's even less powerful than a try because it's kind of like we don't even have a plan for it or anything. We don't have any kind of commitment or declaration around it. We're just like, yeah, I should do this sometime. So what can be helpful to do with this if you're looking for a practice is to write down all of the things you feel you should do. Remember to give yourself permission to have shoulds. So you don't have to be like, I shouldn't want that. Well, great. Now you've created a, just a different flavor of what you should do. You should, should not, whatever. So write that list of all the things you should, and then get clear, like, what am I actually willing to move into the must? What, like, for real, what must happen? I must X, Y, and Z. I must A, B, and C. My friend, a friend of mine, who trained coaches for a while and i had a conversation where like hopefully at this point you are clear that i really stand for coaches to work with our own coaches for a lot of reasons one of the big ones is if a coach is training other coaches and they're not in their own work then their the place where their work is stagnant and your work always stagnates stagnates when you're not in it Transformation is not something that just runs perpetually like a perpetual motion machine. We got to put fuel into it. The fuel of that is getting into conversation with your own coach. So if someone's training coaches, the impact of them not taking on their work is much greater than just a coach coaching clients. Still kind of sucks because when I'm coaching clients, they're, wherever I'm stuck, that's going to get transmitted to the clients and then they're going to be stuck in the same place. But when I'm training coaches, it's exponentially multiplied because every coach I train will get my blind spot and then they're going to coach a bunch of people and those people are going to get the blind spot. So it, it compounds. So I really believe it's important to, for coaches, especially those that want to dispense to support other coaches in this game, to work with their own coach. We've got to be models for this. So my friend told me, um, yeah, you know, I, I want a coach. I just haven't found one that resonates for me. You may have heard me tell this story before. So that's a should right there. I should get a coach. When I find the coach, I'll get the coach. And my stand from was like, dude, you got to, like, I didn't use these words at the time, but you got to, I, I want to invite you to turn that into a must to stop giving yourself an excuse for why not do your work. No shoulds in this. Shoulds allow room for an excuse, right? I should do this, but every should is attached with a but. I should take this on, but there's your excuse. A must has no excuse. I must do this. You can try to put the but in there, but bam, the must defeats it. So that's the stand I brought to my friend. Like, dude, no, you're, you're leading this work. You're putting yourself out there as someone modeling leadership in this work. Take on your work, dude. Take that on. Please do it for me, if not for yourself. 
And so what that meant was he had to stop sitting back waiting for the right coach to show up and he had to take a bunch of action to find the right coach great you haven't found it what are you going to do by when will you have found the coach make a declaration take the actions commensurate to creating that declaration turn the should into a must there's power when we do that it's annoying sometimes because it forces us to confront whatever we've been putting off that we didn't want to confront but it's also the reason why when you create that shift it moves your life forward it's because you confront the thing you've been avoiding that's that's good stuff. That's juicy work, juicy ass work. I'm going to come to our last topic for today. I would love to hear. I would love a viewer audience inspired topic as well. So anyone that's got a question, anyone that's bumped into something in their life where they're like, mm, man, I saw this. What do you see from the lens of leadership? Like, give me something, put something in the chat. I would love to like riff on it just so that we can finish. I'm coming up to the last topic, but if you can do that for me, you will be helping me and all these people and you will get a, um, you'll get kudos and a shout out and you'll be immortalized. Is it immortalized? I think it is. So something, something you've noticed showing up that you think would be cool to hear through the lens of leadership, some experience where you've seen bad leadership and wonder what might be a better way, anything like that. Do us that solid and put it in the chat. And I'm gonna to come to our last distinction before we get to that. Excuse me. What is it about tea that makes me a little burpy? I don't know. Science. So our last distinction is, and then this is another Dushan Ju kick one, playing to win versus playing to lose. I didn't even realize that was in this book. Uh, I read this probably nine or eight years ago. And um, since then, I've used that a lot. I talk about playing to win versus playing to, to not lose quite a bit when I'm talking about how we end up creating our life, where ultimately what our life becomes about, by the way, I have this paperweight on my desk. I really like it. It's, how much, what is this? This is 10 ounces of copper. So anytime I open a book, bam, 10 ounces. Book can't stay out. So I guess I must have um, I must have read this here and then sort of done that thing we all do where we like oh that did I create that no I didn't Dushan did I'll start giving him credit as I quote that in the future but what happens is there's the light of who we are there's there's who we be innately over here brilliance connection passion presence brilliance did I say wit passion presence connection brilliance wit. I feel like I gave myself a bonus one there. Anyhow, those things. And then there's the fears that accompany those. I'm brilliant. I'm afraid of being stupid or being awkward to be around. I'm afraid people find me arrogant. Wit, I'm afraid that I'm boring and dull. Connection, I'm afraid I'm awkward or that I'm too much when I connect with people. Presence, I'm afraid that I'm irrelevant or I'm afraid that I'm too much and take up all the space. Or... What's the last one I had? Really passion. Oh, passion. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm addicted. I'm afraid I'm obsessive and compulsive, or I'm afraid of being apathetic, bored, numb. So you can see all those fears are related to that, that light. So playing to win that game would be like, how do I be and bring more brilliance into the space, more passion, more wit, more connection, all of that, regardless of my circumstances, regardless how this person is showing up in front of me. Playing to not lose is how do I show up in such a way that I don't have to be awkward and uncomfortable? So the game, instead of let's just use awkward and, and uncomfortable. So the playing to win would be how can I be more connection with this person right now? Playing to not lose would be how do I not come across as awkward and uncomfortable? And when I start creating a life to not be awkward and uncomfortable, it's important that we recognize that is a, that expression, being the expression of not awkward and uncomfortable is distinct from being the expression of connection. They might look very similar on the surface, but underneath, they don't. Underneath, they look vastly different. Who I'm being is quite different. And the experience you'll be left in is quite a bit different. So I'm gonna elaborate on that. Uh, thank you, Carol. I'm just looking to see what you guys have put. So, so far, Carol, I appreciate you sharing. She says, I'm, I must wear this blue shirt again next week. It's nice, isn't it? And I should not think twice about it. Great. 
Um, please, again, as I'm sharing, you can do me a huge service by popping something in that chat for me. So the way I came into my life playing not to, to lose, which is to say playing not to come across as awkward and uncomfortable is that I would fill every moment of silence in the conversation with more chat. I was like a chat show host. Everything was glib. There was a joke at just the right time. There was a comment at just the right time. You'd say something and I would say something kind of disarming and, and it would be just funny enough, but not too funny and blah, blah, blah. And there was never any real awkwardness in the conversation. And there was never any real like weird pauses or moments when no one was saying anything. None of the heart of genuine connection was present. It was a polished, perfectly crafted simulacrum of connection without any of the connection. That's the nature of playing to not lose in terms of who we're being on this planet. It took a lot for me to set that down. Before I could go from there to playing to win and practicing connection, I had to be willing to lose. Because if you're gonna go from a game of playing to not lose to a game of playing to win, the transition is you stop playing this game about not losing. And if you stop playing a game designed to not lose, inevitably you're gonna have to lose, right? Drop the game, that's gonna happen. So to move from here over to this place in my life, which is far more rewarding and way more enlightening and enlivening and all of those things that I want from life, I had to come to this middle part, which is where I fucking lost. People found me awkward and uncomfortable because I was learning to be awkward and uncomfortable in the conversation. We'd sit and we'd talk and then I would just sit there for like a really long time waiting while nothing happened in the conversation, sitting in the pause, not knowing what to say. <clears throat> and people at times would feel that was a little awkward. But as I was able to practice with that, sometimes what I noticed is people would feel the silence. And other times I would notice I had something new to say, not glib and whatever, but like, oh, just a genuine question would arise. And that was slowly because I was willing to then lose in the game of being connection. I was able from there to start simply being connection, regardless of whether I won or I lost. That set a lot of my life open. That changed a lot. You can imagine while I was still doing the same things to create clients, who I was being underneath was vastly different. Instead of chatting to people at networking events glibly and making all the right comments and wittiness and all of that, instead I was showing up and being an authentic human being with them. And when we're connecting with an authentic human being, there's more for us to, to plug into. We can actually be with someone and get them. And that drastically changed the kind of results I was getting from doing all the same stuff on the surface. This is why we must do work on our being while practicing doing the right action. There's no substitute for both. We've got to have both of those. So we can do this kind of, this distinction is present in many, many places in our life. Playing to not lose versus playing to win. Playing to not lose at like getting a, I don't know, a, a, let, let's look at like trying to get a job. So playing to not lose would be like, over preparing for the interview, making sure you have an answer for every single thing, researching the people that you're talking to, going through all of that stuff and showing up and saying exactly what you believe they need you to say to make them think you're the person that they want for the job. As opposed to playing to win might be like, hey, what am I trying to win at? I want a job where I really feel like a good fit. Like it feels like a good fit for me and I feel like a good fit for them. Great, you might have to let go then of fabricating this perfect interview experience so that people can get an experience of who you are. That's playing to win. That's the way that actually works. So playing to win versus playing to lose, massive. We got 11 viewers, but no, uh, no one wants to help Adam out. It's okay. Hey, Amy, nice to see you. It's okay, guys. I get it. I don't mind generating. This is how it is. My commitment is to draw you into the space. My commitment is to bring more people into the comments to get to have this be sort of, oh, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate you both holding space and stepping in. But I want to say what I was going to say is my commitment is to get everyone here stepping into the arena with me. 
So that's not just Adam talking about this stuff, but us putting forward, hey, well, what about this? Or, hey, I saw this thing and I'd love to know about that. And part of the reason that you might be enrolled in practicing that is because that's the heart of moving our life forward is generating whatever there is to generate. So often at first, when people start working with me, they show up and they're like, great, what are we going to do, coach? I'm like, don't know. What are we going to do? This is your conversation to generate. And it requires that people start to take a look in their lives and be like, huh, I got to start to take a look now and see where I could be supported. And for people that have spent their whole life never allowing support, never needing support, like this guy, that's an edge. It's always an edge. Every every Monday when I sit down, I'm like, I'm getting coached tomorrow. What am I going to bring? What am I going to work on? So my commitment is to draw you in, to get you to share topics, things that we can look at together. And my practice in terms of spirituality and surrendering to what shows up is to allow this to go wherever it goes. And then I take a look and be like, huh, how did I ask that question? What did I post on Thursday when I asked for topics that had two people instead of four people share that? What might there be for me to do differently? Maybe I need to have a conversation with people up front. Maybe I need to reach out to people directly and ask them. I don't know. So I'm always looking at both of those things, being totally okay with how it goes and maintaining and honoring my commitment. So I'm trying to model these distinctions here for you, not for you, but really for me, because it makes my life better. And I trust if I make my life better, I might be able to support you to make yours. Uh, let's see what you brought, Andrew. This is great. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you. So Andrew says, one place I found that has shown up this year are folks who have decided they wanted a next step on a phone conversation. Hey, Maria, nice to see you. A sample session, a coaching program, etc. However, once they're off the phone, the commitment was dodged. And at the times, they've completely dropped out of communication. So they're ghosting Andrew. I'm okay with the fact that communication has dropped and have kept the door open, but it really makes me wonder at times how best to serve. So here's my thought about what might be happening. Oftentimes, people will talk to a coach or a leader and they'll get excited, like they'll get passionate. They'll sense that something could shift. They'll be with you and they'll be like, ooh, this person's kind of cool. And so their energy gets kind of kicked up. They're like, oh yeah, okay, what's next from that energy? But there's no substance yet to it. So they're inspired, but they're not really uh, enrolled or committed. This is a tricky one for us to distinguish. It's, it requires a bit of a, like a nuanced scalpel. I'm trying to think if I have, I know I have some examples. I'm just trying to remember one. Um, I'll often see this with people who are like, um, corporate executive leadership. So they're doing CEO, something like that. And the way that they've created their success, the way they've lived into the world and thrived into the world up to this point has been like a bias to action, figure the thing out, take the action, figure the thing out, take the action. So they don't have much capacity to slow down and sit. And like, that's consequently what's gotten them here. They're creating a bunch of results that are available from that way of being, but there's also a whole world of results and stuff and experiences in life for which the only way to get there would be for them to be able to really slow down and sit in something, including their dissonance, their, their discomfort with not moving forward, all of that sort of stuff. So these people will come to me and we'll start to talk and um, they're like, so what, what does it look like to work together? And I'll share a little bit and I'll be like, you know, the first question really is like, what do you actually want in your life? Because until we have that, the logistics of working together are irrelevant. That would be like, before we even talk, like before we even consider whether you want to live in a house, a condo, a hut, a yurt, where you want to live, whether you want to live in a house or a condo, or if you'd actually be happier living in an apartment, it'd be like you sitting down and being like, tell me everything about mortgages. How long do I have to be in a mort? Like it's going all the way there. So this is their way of being showing up. They start talking to me and they get enthused about who I am. So they're kind of inspired by the way I show up with them. But again, there's none of their own energy in this. There's none of their own buy-in. There's just inspiration. The kind of, you know, when you have a lot of energy um, from drinking too much coffee and it's like, you have the energy 
but there's none of your own, there's no substance to it. So you're kind of like high in the clouds and then you smash to the ground. So that's what's happening here, I think, Andrew, is you're getting on a conversations with people and they're like, jazz they're like yeah what's next let's move forward not really aware that their bias is to just move forward and they're like let's do the thing let's do the thing and then you get off the phone and that coffee like energy that inspiration that they had in the moment falls away and then the next day or a week later they're looking at the email from you or they're looking at your calendar link or their whatever and they're like i don't have time for this why even do this anyhow and then they look at their life and they're like, it doesn't seem that bad. It's not like I'm missing out on stuff. I could be okay with this. You know what? I think I just need to, and then they're, they're what I can tell you inevitably is going to happen is they're going to say, I think I just need to, and then they're going to say to themselves, whatever it is that for their entire life, they've been telling themselves, I think I just need to. They're just going to try to redo the same thing that they always do because that's what's predictable left to our own devices. So, with these people, we really want to feel into them. Like, do they feel genuinely bought into something here? Or are they high on the fumes? Have they been drinking a bunch of coffee with me? And they're just like, great, what's next? How do we move forward? How do we do this? Well, let's slow down. Why would you even devote an hour out of the next week to a conversation with me? Like, what, what for do that? And this is the art of slowing our clients down. And the cool thing is you're going to feel resistance from them. And sometimes when you slow them down, even though this is exactly what there is to do, even though you're standing for them, they're going to get annoyed by that and they're going to leave. And some of those people just never show up. I had a conversation with someone who, um, uh, someone put me in touch very generously. They're like, hey, you got to talk to Adam if you want to talk about leadership. And they're like, oh, cool. So we get on the phone and I'm like, I just reach out to them. I'm like, great, you want to talk? Jump on the phone for a half hour, whatever, connect. We get on the phone and he's like, we chat for like five minutes. He's like, okay, so I'm going to leave this in your court, Adam. Like, you know, this is yours to, to do. And, uh, you know, I don't know how you um, get people to start working with you or anything. And I was like, uh, sorry, is that the context? For the, I, I wasn't even, uh, is that what we want to talk about? Is like how it looks like to work with me? And he was like, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm looking for this, blah, blah, blah. And so I, first of all, notice the speediness, right? Like, I'm like, let's hop on the phone and connect. And this guy's like, great, how do we work together? And he's trying to figure out already, can I afford this guy? Does this guy's logistics fit into the world I already have? There's no reason to work with me other than that developing his leadership is a good idea. Developing your leadership as a good idea is a should. It's something to try. There's no commitment underneath that. There's no must. You, there's no, I must develop my leadership. There's, I must learn how to better communicate with my people so they don't mutiny. I must do this so that I can achieve the goal that I've set for myself next year. That is a must. I'd like to be a better leader or I feel I'm called to be a better leader. That's a should. You don't need to do that. You should do it. It sounds good. And so this guy got on the phone with me. He's in the should of being a better leader. And I'm slowing him down. I'm like, well, what do you really want? Oh, I just want to be a better leader. You know, I'm kind of blah, blah, blah. And he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't stop there. And so I'm like, okay, well, look, here's what the next conversation would be if you want. Is you and I getting on the phone and actually getting clear on what you want. Because right now there's not really anything there. You have this idea that leadership's a good idea. But I don't know what, what for do any of that. And it's going to be uncomfortable and hard work for you. And it's going to put you to face your own confrontation. And without a reason to do that, other than I should, because it's nice to be a better leader, that confrontation is going to defeat you. So let me know. If you're interested, we can have that chat. He's like, totally. I send him an email the next uh, day. I'm like, here's some stuff, some information that might be helpful. L here's what I've got available for times. Let me know. Because he asked, he, uh, normally I would schedule on the call, but he asked like, well, send me an email, we'll do that. Don't hear anything from him for a week. Those times are all gone. I write back and I'm like, hey man, the times have gone. Let me know if you'd like something else. And he's like, I don't think uh, your program is the one for me right now. Like, <laughs> it's totally fine, right? But just notice there's no program on the table. There was no offer of coaching on the table. There's none of that. All that was on the table was, hey, let's figure out what you actually want. So. My stand for this person, because I'm so clear 
that's where there is for him to commit to is he's just not at that place. And, you know, what he might have to do is go and work with a bunch of people that are like, here's my program. Let's give you the program. We're going to do this. You're going to get up and do five burpees. Then you're going to send seven emails. Then you're going to do this. And by the end of it, you'll get an A plus on your leader chart. He might have to go and work with a bunch of those people and bankrupt this idea before he can come back either to me or someone else and be like, yo, I've worked with some people. It didn't work. It sucked. Where do we go? And at that point, he's going to be a little more willing to sit still and to listen. Sorry, that makes it sound like there's stuff for me to put onto him, but he's going to be a little more willing. Yeah, he's going to be a little more willing to sit still and listen to the voice of his own heart rather than what he thinks he should do to get to where he needs to get to next. Blah, 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 blah. So that's an example over here in my life, Andrew, of where something very similar has happened. So when you notice that happening, start taking a look at like, is my, is, does my client feel high on fumes? Do I buy their enthusiasm? And if not, learn to trust that. Yeah, we could talk about what's next, but you know, my intuition is you're asking that, but we're not, I'm not feeling it from you yet. And I would much rather support you to get to a place where there's a real reason for you to be a what's next rather than doing it because you should. Because my hunch is you're doing stuff because you should everywhere in your life. And it probably feels as temporarily inspiring. And then later, I don't think I'm going to do that as it is going to show up here. What do you say? Really, really great question, Andrew. Really, really love it. Okay. Well, what do we have next? I got a call at noon and then I'm going to talk to my friend Toku McCree for an hour. And then I'm going to slide into the weekend. And I hope you guys do the same. Thanks everyone for every fun. Thanks every fun. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Thanks everyone for the topics you bring, the chats. Congratulations, Sheila and Andrew, for being in the process of uh, certifying. Um, and hey, just great to see some um, names I haven't seen in a while. Maria, great to see you. Abril, really nice to see you show up. Uh, Carol, good to see you. Uh, shout outs to everyone that shows up and hangs out. It's been a great one. We'll catch you guys next week. Peace. <laughs>